Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7 Israel at War update. And today is the 31st day since the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, perpetrating a massacre of 1,400 mostly civilians, abducting over 240 others, including infants and children, and wounding over 4,800. As we continue to update you from here in Jerusalem, without further ado, let's turn to central Israel, where we're joined by TV7's editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, what can you update us with on the latest? So, Jonathan, in physics, as well as in the military art, everyone is familiar with time-space equations. And if Israel uh, is not uh, uh, too stingy with its uh, time, uh, it will have its diplomatic space very constricted. Uh, it must uh, advance um, much more swiftly in order to get to the uh, core of the Hamas uh, command and control network and find and uh, execute the uh, leaders of the barbaric massacre perpetrated exactly a month ago. Uh, and if it doesn't uh, do so, the uh, forces around it, both the moderate Arab countries as well as Western countries, not to speak of uh, those hostile to Israel, will limit uh, its freedom of maneuver. Uh, so the forces are uh, in Gaza. They have cut the uh, strip in two. Uh, there was a time when a French author used to say that he loves Germany so much that uh, he wants it uh, to uh, remain divided between West and East. Israel loves Gaza so much that it now has North Gaza and South Gaza. In Jerusalem, we had uh, a terror act today. Uh, a female uh, uh, officer, uh, a police officer, was stabbed and badly wounded. And in the north, uh, still uh, rockets and uh, the evacuation of uh, most of the uh, inhabitants there. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Let's turn immediately to the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, Brigadier General and Reserve Doron Gavish. General, could you provide us with an operational update focused particularly on the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip? Yes. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. I think it is important to highlight uh, what was uh, said by the IDF in the last uh, 24 a bit more uh, hours. And this is that uh, basically the Gaza Strip now is being split to two parts. Uh, the northern part and where the Gaza city is there, the majority of the Hamas terrorists are there, their infrastructures, their, their command posts and uh, so on, and then the south part of, uh, of the Gaza Strip. Uh, so uh, from a military point of view, Gaza Strip now is being uh, contained, uh, the IDF is around it and starting the fight in into the city itself against uh, the Hamas uh, terrorists. Uh, of course, the Air Force strikes are uh, still there against Hamas uh, targets. Uh, so I think this is something significant that was released yesterday. The other thing uh, that was released is the Israeli efforts uh, asking again and again the civilians uh, on the north part to, to move to the south part of uh, of the Gaza Strip. Uh, there were flyers that were sent to them, uh, more than 20,000 uh, telephone calls uh, that uh, civilians received from uh, Israeli officials asking them to go to the south. Israel even opened the uh, corridors exactly for this between the, the north and the south. And uh, of course, we continuously see the Hamas, uh, which is trying to hold uh, this population to move because he sees them, uh, he's, uh, has his uh, human uh, shields, uh, but there, there is a real effort in trying uh, to do this by the, uh, by the Israeli uh, IDF. And the last time, the last thing to, uh, to mention is, of course, uh, that uh, there was a, a long-range uh, missile shot uh, from uh, the Gaza Strip uh, through the south part of uh, Israel, and this was intercepted by uh, an aerial missile uh, again, uh, showing an effective uh, multi-tier uh, defense against uh, all ranges. Thank you, General. I'd like to immediately turn to Spain, Madrid, where we're joined by Dr. Rafael Bardaki, the CEO of Worldwide Strategy and former National Security Advisor of the Kingdom of Spain. 
Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Barrahi. What can you provide us with on the latest vis-a-vis -vis the European approach uh, to the Israeli uh, conflict with the terrorist organizations in the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip? Well, we have two different problems here. One is that the Arab street is still at while in across Europe from major demonstrations from London to Madrid to Berlin in the last days. So I think that's a, a, a big problem. But secondly, uh, which is more important probably as an impact on the operations in Gaza conducted by the IDF is that the, the governments are now talking for the first time in one month about uh, the discomfort, uh, the pressures from Arab countries and uh, uh, in order to ask for a pause or a kind of a temporary ceasefire, more than just humanitarian ceasefire as the Americans are, are, are mentioning. So governments in Europe are very weak, and I'm afraid the clock is ticking against uh, Israel in that sense from the European perspective. The good thing is that Europe is totally irrelevant. So what, whatever they say have a little impact. The more important actor here is obviously the White House and the U.S. With that being said, if I may follow up on this very briefly, we see that the masses of Islamist migrants into Europe uh, joined by basically the left wing or the, the marginal left wing within uh, uh, continental Europe. The United Kingdom, of course, is also uh, uh, plagued with that. Uh, what, what can you tell us about the complexities at hand uh, from that perspective? I hear from many people across Europe who are quite concerned by this development and are looking towards their governments for a tangible response. Yes, indeed. I think uh, for the first time in many decades, people have seen what young immigrants from the Muslim countries, very radicalized, very opposed to our way of life, can be able and willing to do, you know, to Israel and to Jews, people, people living in Europe, and to us, all which are infidels in theory, you know, according to their radical views. Uh, but at the same time, we have a powerful left in Europe, which uh, is still looking for a new proletariat, and they think they found it in the uh, radical Islam. No? So it's a complex situation, obviously. Let's turn immediately also to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs, Brigadier or retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. Thank you for joining us, General. I'd like to hear your perspective from uh, the American administration's conduct at this stage, obviously demanding or calling on Israel for a pause being rejected until and unless hostages are released in exchange for such a humanitarian pause. And I think it's also important to distinct for the sake of our viewers, a pause usually lasts only for a couple of hours as opposed to a ceasefire, which may last for a couple of days. Uh, what are the complexities in the approach to such a matter? Well, first of all, I, I would note uh, that it is clear that Blinken came into the region with the view of humanitarian pause, but now he's even rejected the notion of ceasefire and pause. Uh, but I think it's important also, Jonathan, if I can diverge for a moment, uh, the protests that happened over the weekend, the pro-Palestinian protests in America, are becoming very, very intelligent, and Biden is sitting up and watching. Uh, their, their protest theme yesterday was no ceasefire, no votes. And it's important to recognize that we have a significant moderate Muslim community inside of Michigan, one of the battleground states. So I think you're really seeing the Palestinian supporters in America getting away from uh, anti-Semitism in their message to more of, we want to see aid to Gaza or we're going to hold back our votes. And for a situation that Biden is in right now, where his support is already slipping uh, and has been well before October 7th, uh, I don't think that uh, we can ignore what's going on in the states with regards to uh, Palestinian protests linked to Biden votes, Biden votes linked to Biden policy. And with regard, if uh, I may ask uh, that you follow up on the uh, various complexities right now that the United States is dealing with. Obviously, we heard of a nuclear uh, submarine that is also being now deployed into the region in order to contend with uh, ongoing prospects of wider escalation. At, 
so let me be very clear. That is a submarine that is equipped with conventional weapons, but all of our nuclear uh, submarines, all of our submarines are nuclear powered. So this is not a nuclear armed submarine coming into the region. Uh, it brings a significant amount of capability uh, as regards cruise missiles, cruise missiles which could be extremely effective uh, in, say, a Hezbollah attack from southern Lebanon. So it is clear that uh, while there are the political considerations going on in Washington, D.C., uh, it's also clear that CENTCOM is still ignoring uh, the, the politics, focusing on its mission, which is the defense for friends and allies in the region. Thank you, General. Let's turn immediately also to Mr. Oren Amir. I'd like also to hear about uh, the complexities with the hostages. Ongoing negotiations are taking place. Obviously, Secretary of State Blinken was here to also deliberate this matter. But we hear also that CIA Director William Burns is in the country, also communicating with his interlocutors in order to advance a cause that is as much as um, uh, American as it is Israeli, as well as 30 other nations who have their citizens being currently uh, held hostage by the Islamist Hamas in Gaza. Yes, but first, just as a footnote to what uh, General Kimmich just said, in effect, what the U.S. is giving Israel is a second strike capability, conventionally, of course, so that if Israeli air bases are being hit, of course, the Israeli Air Force uh, has made preparations uh, to disperse uh, it's uh, fighter planes. It is not waiting for uh, a surprise attack. But nevertheless, Hezbollah now knows that even if it manages to cripple Israel's uh, strategic arm, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, with its uh, uh, carrier task forces and uh, the submarine uh, can supply Israel with a second strike. Now, regarding the uh, uh, hostages, obviously this is the top priority for President Biden. And it seems that even within Israel, it has climbed up the ladder. It used to be almost an afterthought at first. And now, uh, because of the domestic pressure by the uh, hostage families and uh, the supporters, the Israeli government must uh, consider it its top priority, at least uh, on the timeline. It is much more urgent than taking care of the Hamas leadership, which can wait another day, another week. And apparently, because uh, the cabinet has designated Mossad chief Dadi Barnea as the uh, man to go regarding the hostage negotiations, it makes sense that his counterpart, uh, DCI Burns, is uh, in the region uh, in order to effect it. Thank you, Mr. Oren. General Gavish, I'd like to hear from your perspective uh, an operational update, if you will, about our current challenges up north, considering the fact that Hezbollah has not ceased any hostilities following Hassan Nasrallah's uh, speech and is probing the, the Israeli border, obviously conducting itself in a similar fashion to what uh, the Palestinian so-called rioters were doing in the weeks leading up to the onslaught on October 7th. Well, uh, you're right, uh, Jonathan. We still see those uh, operation in the northern, the, uh, in our northern border, the, with the with the Hezbollah terrorist organization. Uh, we should say that we are still under the war uh, treasures and uh, all the hostilities that uh, we see there are, I would say, managed by the Hezbollah in a way that uh, we understand at least at this point that they are not aiming uh, for the. A full-scale uh, war. Of course, we are uh, completely ready to such an option. Uh, we are not going to take uh, any chances. Uh, we all had our lessons uh, from the 7th uh, of October. But looking on the behavior, at, le at least as it, it, it looks, also in the last uh, 24 hours, they are shooting some rockets, uh, maybe some UAV, some uh, anti-tank uh, missiles that are being shot. Uh, toward Israel, but but all of those have been uh, successfully, uh, in mass, vast majority in the, of them have been successfully encountered by the IDF. Those rockets, most of them have been intercepted. Uh, uh, the UAVs are being shot down, and uh, the the rockets uh, that uh, or the 
missiles that are being uh, shot toward Israel, most of the units, the Hezbollah uh, terrorist units, are being hit even before they manage to shoot uh, their, uh, their missiles. So we still see it happening in this uh, area, also in the last uh, 24 hours. Of course, it is uh, Im important to mention that uh, what was released yesterday by the United States, it is uh, super important that uh, knowing that uh, this, uh, you know, I had, I had uh, the privilege uh, few years ago to visit myself uh, such a submarine. This is a very impressive uh, war machine uh, with a conventional, but uh, but uh, I would say very sophisticated uh, missiles and capabilities, uh, which is very important for, for this uh, region. And uh, of course, it would allow the United States uh, to enlarge its uh, all options, I would say, in all different directions. Uh, that uh, could uh, occur in uh, in this region, and this is very important. Thank you, General Kavish. I'd like to immediately turn to Dr. Bardahi. As a strategist, when you look at the Middle East, and obviously you you see uh, that Hamas has been obviously uh, enabled by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Le uh, Lebanon is plagued with Hezbollah, which has dominated that country uh, to the abyss so to speak, and unfortunately is now also preparing itself uh, for war with Israel, as well as uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen. We see Iran's tentacles operating uh, simultaneously in order to prepare themselves for a wider conflagration, something that Iran is obviously directing, facilitating, funding, and also providing the weaponry to follow up on. How do you see this complexity evolve since Obviously, the war between Israel and Hamas and its affiliated terror groups in Gaza Strip are all at, operating in not only at the behest of Islam, as they boastfully proclaim, but uh, also at the behest of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Well, Jonathan, I think it's very important to reestablish and recreate, regenerate the terrorists in an effective way not only vis-a-vis -vis Hamas, but all about the, the head of the, 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 the octopus, no? which is in Tehran. No? And in that, in that sense, I think uh, Israel needs not only a clear victory, but uh, we all need a kind of humiliating victory, not only over Hamas, but on, on all the movements that are behind uh, Tehran all across the region and in the world. No? We need to reestablish the terrorists in an effective way, and that can only be achieved through a clear-cut victory in Gaza and in the streets in Europe and in the region in general, no? As having in mind, obviously, the head of the snake, which is clearly the Republic Islamic of, of uh, Iran. Thank you, Dr. Bardahi. I'd like also to ask you, General Kemet, considering the fact that when we look uh, at the, the various complexities, and, you know, I, you know, I need to put things, obviously our viewers are aware of this. I am a uh, conservative Christian, look at the world in a prism that uh, uh, aligns myself with this uh, uh, reality. Nevertheless, when I, I look at what the Biden administration has done, A, it was uh, quite impressive in its rapid response, uh, standing up for Israel, but also standing up for the morals and values that the United States has stood for for so many years. But if we look at everything that led to this moment, it was one after another decisions on a geostrategic scale that were quite frankly emboldening the enemies and adversaries of the United States to act and has also allowed for a vacuum to emerge that ultimately emboldened even Hamas to jab at Israel, if I may call that massacre and the abhorrent activities that were conducted in that scale uh, a jab, but uh, to the degree that Israel brought about its wrath upon the terror organizations in the Gaza Strip with an outlook of the complexities throughout the entire region. Yeah, I would simply say that Bob Gates uh, is right. Our former Secretary of Defense, former CIA director, former National Security Deputy Director, uh, he said that Joe Biden hasn't made a good foreign policy decision in his entire career. Uh, we saw that when he was President Obama's vice president. Uh, we also see that now where he's brought the exact same team in with him 
And the echo chamber among that foreign policy team is quite dramatic. Uh, all you have to do is read this month's foreign affairs uh, article by Jake Sullivan, which had to be redacted when it went online because it was so out of date by the time it was published as they were th basically thumping their chests about what a great job they were doing in Gaza. So I, I would say the challenge with this administration is they're very, very tactical. They try to solve each problem one at a time. There is no holistic uh, geostrategic view that this administration has. And I think in many ways, that's what's led to the problems we're seeing today. Unfortunately, uh, you make me think about the quote by Sun Tzu, tactics uh, absent uh, a strategy is the slowest way to defeat. Um, but Mr. Oren, if we look at the various complexities at hand, what do you put your finger on as the core issue right now to focus upon? Both the uh, Israeli military and public are highly motivated following the massacre and um, are determined uh, to win uh, regardless of the cost, except for the hostages. However, um, there is some disappointment uh, because of the uh, routine uh, methods that the IDF uh, has been uh, conducting uh, itself in Gaza. No special operation, no indirect uh, approach. Maybe they are still working on it and uh, we will wake up one day to find out that, uh, yes, they had something up their sleeve. General Gavish, uh, your perspective on the various complexities at hand, and also if, if you can touch briefly on uh, the multi-tier system, obviously in collaboration with the United States under CENTCOM that was put in place in the event of a multi-sector conflagration, obviously within the bounds of what you're allowed to say. Yeah, I, I would just uh, would like to refer for a second. I, I really don't know about any disappointment that there is the thought the way that the IDF is uh, conducting the war in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the contrary, I think that uh, what the Israeli public is seeing and the world is seeing a very professional uh, way of uh, fighting the uh, first of the ground forces together with the Air Force uh, and the Navy and everything is very coordinated, very professional, the, very professionally uh, being conducted. So I think this is what we see. We see a very professional military who's doing his job and they will continue to do his job because he's, deter he's, he's determined uh, to win this war. Uh, of course, for the multi-tier defense, this is uh, something that uh, for the first time was uh, fully uh, applied during uh, this war. We used to see in the past, uh, only the Iron Dome uh, that was the one who was defending Israel against the rocket that were coming, uh, mainly for the Gaza Strip. But this, uh, during this war, we saw the full array of uh, defense and the multi-tier concept uh, was uh, very effective, I would say. Uh, we all remember that there were uh, some missiles that have been shot uh, from the Red Sea, very long uh, distance ones, some distance ones which were coming uh, also from the Gaza Strip and uh, basically Israel applied all his uh, tier, the Iron Dome, the David Sling, the Arrow, uh, which is, uh, I think, very impressive. Uh, uh, the results are very impressive, but we also emphasize all the time, mainly to the Israeli population, that uh, the defense is never a matter. And uh, we still need to, uh, we still need to uh, listen to the orders uh, which are issued by the home front command and uh, once there is a siren and we know that there is a ray of uh, missiles of rocket being shot at Israel uh, everyone needs to go to the shelter and uh, this combination of kinetic interception from one hand and from the other hand going to the shelter this is what saved uh, hundreds uh, of lives here in Israel and fortunately the number of people that were hit by uh, rockets uh, during this war is very low. Dr. Bardahi, we have roughly two minutes left, so I'll give you one and uh, one for General Kimmet. Um, what do you look at right now that Israel should focus on within the range of complexities at hand? Well, I think on the foreign front, there is a diplomatic challenge which to convince the capitals in Europe and Washington in particular that the IDF needs more time to accomplish their uh, tactical and strategic goals. Buying time is vital for 
the victory of Israel, and that's what they should be focused on the diplomatic front, I think. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bardakhi. General Kemet? Uh, my only point would be that Adorno is right. The, the Israeli Defense Forces have done brilliantly, which is unfortunately uh, why your country has lost the moral authority among some of the capitals in the world. Uh, you are no longer being seen as a victim of brutalist terrorist aggression. You're now being seen as a bully. The question now is, uh, yes, 1,100 uh, Israelis were lost, but how many lives do the Palestinians need to lose before the bill is paid? So it goes back to Emil's original point. You were losing space. You were losing time. This has got to be accelerated because the world is starting to turn against you. And I say that as a friend. I appreciate that very much. I think it's very important to, to note the fact that uh, there is a double standard here. If we look at the disinformation being pushed forward very, very robustly, it impacts uh, the, the masses ultimately to follow various narratives. It has uh, nothing to do with reality. It's completely detached. Looking at the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, for instance, which was concerned uh, of the PLO during the 1970s and the attacks that were committed against the people of Jordan, time and again, it took them a period of time, including the hijacking and bombing of three air, uh, air carriers uh, that were ultimately civilian carriers with a destination to both London and New York, were bombed on live television. But these generations don't remember that anymore. And then, of course, Jordan, according to the figures, went on and attacked the Palestinians killing some 3,500, if I'm not mistaken, uh, according to the official figures. Obviously, those figures are a lot higher in reality, but uh, we will leave the double standard for another update since we ran out of time. I'd like to thank Mr. Oren, General Gavish, Dr. Bardahi, and General Kimmet for taking out of your times to update us on the latest. And I'd like also to take this opportunity to thank all of you and to highlight TV7 Israel is 100% donation-based. And therefore, if you're blessed by our productions and would like to help support our accumulating costs for these daily updates, please do so by visiting our website at www.tv7israelnews.com. Following this update, we will, of course, air our regular TV7 Israel News at 9 p.m. Until then, shalom from me here in Jerusalem. Shalom, I'm Danny Ayalon, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy foreign minister and member of Knesset. Today, I'm very privileged to be hosting TV7's Middle East Review and also being a panelist of the various shows of TV7, which I find the most uh, enlightening, most educating. If you really want to understand the world, the global scene, as well as the regional scene of the Middle East, it is worthwhile to watch TV7.